So good afternoon, everybody back from your break. I hope you've all got a cup of tea. Um, I've been joined by my colleagues here, Danielle, Ben, Don, Rebecca and Callie. Thank you all for such wonderful talks and presentations today. Unfortunately, not all the speakers could join us. Um, so those questions that were um, sent in that pertain to those speakers, I will be covering those probably after the event. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to go through my list of questions and ask our panel to give us their experts review on them. So my first question um, is to Rebecca from the Food Standards Agency and it's in relation to a change of uh, habits. It's, it's about how many businesses have changed from retail to home delivery in terms of the, the, the food retail sector. Um, this is an interesting thing from a UK perspective and something that I probably come to some of the guys from the US on to understand if, that, if it's been a, some, a trend that you've seen also. Uh, Rebecca. Thank you very much, Helen. And uh, yeah, so, um, so I'm afraid I don't have the statistics. I think that this is something that um, is probably a constantly changing picture, actually, as we've been in and out of lockdown and as businesses have been able to welcome customers in and then have had to close their doors again. Um, but we do know that overall it, it was this was already home delivery was already a growing trend even before COVID. Um, obviously, you know, it's come to the fore during COVID. Um, and in fact, the other trend that we know is growing, which um, uh, amongst other statistics is, 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 is this is part of our national statistics um, that you can find on the Office for National Statistics um, website is, is that food eaten outside the home is also a growing category. So um, uh, and that's um, uh, there's, a, there's a kind of um, there are two ways to look at this, but, but essentially what we're saying is there's a trend away from people preparing fresh cooked meals. Uh, themselves and um, a trend and move towards people um, having food that's been prepared by somebody else, which um, which is quite an important shift. So, so I don't have those exact statistics, but um, but this is part of some overall changes to the way in which we we consume food here in the UK and I'm sure globally as well. Carly, have you have you seen this in Delaware? Yes, definitely an increase in use of delivery services and one nice aspect of that is that it's benefiting the restaurants they're able to stay in business and we see really good connections with local communities and local businesses and certainly there is work to do in reinforcing good food safety behavior but it's been great to see economically that those businesses are able to survive okay. ben yeah absolutely i'd echo um the previous comments um two two things that i I think we we've seen in in working with some of the um the food service industry on this has been the rise of ghost kitchens which was a trend that that we saw before the pandemic and so a ghost kitchen is really where maybe three or four or up you know in some cases maybe 20 different businesses come together in a in a large setting um operating uh, in a shared use kitchen um where where but it's a whole bunch of businesses and they're delivering out of that as opposed to like an actual storefront and so we've seen just a massive increase in that throughout throughout the us it was you know pushed by the by the pandemic the other thing is um changing menus to accommodate delivery um limiting um types of food that that they're uh, just quality wise doesn't stand up to the delivery process doesn't have the same kind of presentation especially in some of our um, independent restaurants and so so I, I I you know I think from where we were 18 months ago to now it's very common to see two separate um, uh, types of menus here's the curbside or delivery um, menu versus uh, what you're going to get in, in a restaurant which I, that, I, I don't see that trend going away okay Don, has any, have you got a comment on that? Yeah, I, I want to echo again as uh, some of the earlier comments. One of the things that I've seen with the pandemic is it's catalyzed 
trends that were already happening, right? Work from home was already capital was already happening. So we've catalyzed that. Uh, delivery services and, and shopping services were already happening and it catalyzed that to almost to the extent that those services were overwhelmed. Um, mm -hmm. But I would say based on my, my work with folks in those industries, they have been very appreciative of the chance to expand their businesses, but they're also cognizant of now the, the increased responsibility. And so, uh, and again, I haven't worked with all the players, but but the players that I've worked with have taken this new responsibility very seriously. And that's and that's a good thing. And I mean, to Callie's point too, about trying to, to keep local restaurants open, I know, you know, we're trying to do, although I'm not a big fan of delivery services, because I guess I'm not a millennial, um, I, we are a big fan of patronizing our local restaurants. And so, mm -hmm. and also I'm a little bit of a control freak like I want to pick up the food when I want it and I want it to be hot so I'm gonna I'm gonna do it myself rather than mm. a, a, use a delivery service um, but I, but I think all of those things are are probably good they're gonna they may they certainly saw a bump during the pandemic and then once we're all vaccinated and, and things are calmer I think that the levels are going to go down but they're gonna they're, they found a new a new high level and I think they're going to stay at that high level as we move mm -hmm. forward okay thanks Don Rebecca did you want to comment yeah, I was just going to come back actually on um, uh, uh, the reference to ghost kitchens and som sometimes we also talk about dark kitchens and um, I just wanted to emphasise that that language sounds a bit terrifying as though that there's, there's, a, you know, there's something um, something terrible going on here and, and I think that there can be two different things happening. So firstly, um, you know, if there's if there's a business that's set up and is unregulated and is operating under the radar, uh, etc., that 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 that's um, unacceptable and uh, is something that we'd all want to stamp out. Um, but but the idea of these, um, these these new facilities that are set up essentially to serve the delivery market is is something quite different, and they are definitely regulated. There is a responsibility there. Uh, depending on the arrangement, and I think this is this is where, as regulators, we we need to keep in really close touch with new developments to know, you know, um, how, how we regulate uh, environments like that. But uh, rest assured, they are regulated. We do know about them, um, and in fact. Um, uh, it's an opportunity for us in, in the FSA. We've been doing some really um, interesting uh, work with the data, publicly available data uh, to see um, how much information we can gather um, about these um, and pop up businesses. That's another ca new category. Um, so, so to try and try and get some more real time information about what's out there so that we can pass that information along to local authorities and enforcement agencies and make sure that they are indeed properly regulated. So, um, yes, there are lots of change at the moment going on and we have to keep up. I think that um, that's really important what you've just said, Rebecca, because one of the questions that came in subsequently was about enforcement of sort of um, the the non the, the regulation side of all of these ghost kitchens or pop-up kitchens and so on. And I, that is obviously quite a challenging thing for regulators. Are you finding it? from a local authority perspective uh, quite difficult? Is it challenging for the, the Food Science Agency at the moment? I think it depends. I think that they're sort of um, the, the, the rate of change and the number of these new styles of business would, 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 would be very different depending on the location um, and obviously in urban centres for example then um, you know, that can be um, that there can be a big, big growth. And I think the other thing is that sometimes they can be in places where you wouldn't normally expect to find a food business. So, um, again, just thinking about, you know, if you're a local authority enforcement officer, you'll you'll have a really good idea of your patch and where the businesses are and the patterns of trade. So, again, it's just about keeping up with the changes, um, knowing where to, to look for them. But um, my recollection is when we did look, um, and as I say, we've we've been kind of scanning the um, you know pub publicly available information, um, you, you know things things that seem quite obvious. I'm sure, like you know, looking on the um, delivery platforms to see who's listed there, and then checking that against the businesses that are registered. Um, you know, we found in general actually we do we do know about most things happening, and um, you know, generally people do want to do the right thing, and they are. Um, engaging with local authorities and going through the right processes. So, um, so, so we're pleased with that. But as I say, we need to need to make sure we're on our toes and we're we're very alive to these new developments. Okay, thank you for that, guys. I think we've lost Don uh, for a little minute, and hopefully he'll be back. He'll be back. He texted me and said he has a there's an electrician working on his house. So. Know, it doesn't sound good, does it, Ben? You know, it doesn't <laughs> sound good. But hopefully he'll be back with us. Um, another question around. Um, 
food safety in terms of food foodborne illness. Um, it's be uh, our understanding, the question saying that UK government reports that there's been a notable drop in notifiable foodborne illness in the UK in the last 12 months. Um, so my question would be to Rebecca, um, what would you say were the key contributory factors? And I'm also going to then ask that to sort of Ben uh, and Carly in the US and see if they've got any any sort of view on it from their perspective. Rebecca. Yeah, so so the honest answer is we it's too soon to tell. Uh, I think that this is probably common to, to many different um, countries and food safety authorities uh, across the world, actually. So if you think about the different things that have to happen, obviously the, there's the prevalence of the disease itself, but then uh, somebody would need to go to their doctor. Uh, the doctor would then um, need to see them. They, they, they'd need to be there in person or there'd, there'd need to be some kind of sampling done. Goes to the laboratory. The laboratory then has to have the capacity to do that. Uh, and there are lots of stages in that chain um, where the, simply the reporting or the testing is not happening in, in the same numbers um, for very obvious reasons. You know, certainly earlier in the pandemic, public health laboratories and testing facilities were um, you know, rightly using their resources to respond to COVID. Uh, and people we know just weren't visiting their GPs. I think that's you know something that we've all seen um, in terms of the use of health services. So although um, the numbers of those confirmed lab confirmed cases is what we we report, um, and those have gone down significantly, that that probably um, reflects uh, to a large extent simply that people aren't turning up at their doctors. Perhaps the doctors aren't ordering tests to quite the same extent, and then if they go to the laboratory, um, there may be delays, or in fact, those um, aspects of work may not have been prioritised. So there's a whole, whole lot of things that might have been happening. But um, uh, you know, we're we've got a programme of work underway to try and understand more. But that will inevitably take some some months, if not um, years, before we're we're sort of fully confident that we've understood the impacts. Mm -hmm. Okay, Carly. Anything from you? Yes, I well, I definitely agree with what Rebecca said, and I think it'll be a while to see the full data analysis. There is an interesting graph on the CDC website. If we look specifically at norovirus cases, there has been a sharp decrease in those cases, and who knows exactly what the cause of that is. Could be hand washing, could be less eating out at restaurants. It's probably a combination of all of that plus as Rebecca pointed out, you know, individual people getting sick and going to physicians and hospitals and things like that. So it's probably a combination, but definitely there has been an observed decrease in norovirus cases. Welcome back, Don. <laughs> ben. Yeah, nothing to add. I mean, I, I think that Rebecca and Callie really really nailed it. Um, okay. that, that's it's kind of where we are and, and it's, it's too early to tell. Okay. Um, next question uh, for you guys is around wastewater research. Um, so I'm going to direct that firstly um, at Rebecca. There's a question about a wastewater research being completed in the UK as a surveillance mechanism for SARS-CoV-2. Rebecca, are you aware of um, any research that's happening at the moment in the UK? Uh, yes, yeah, so I have heard about this, but I'm afraid I'm not probably not the right person to ask. Um, okay. so I'm not I'm not on top of the latest plans that we've got, but um, but I have heard this talked about as well. And I know we've um, you, you know so in the course of the pandemic, we've had a number of examples where um, you know that this technique has been used to, to understand a little bit more about the um, uh, you know about the development of, of the illness so um, and, and it is something that's been suggested I'm not sure yet if we have the um, the, the capability and the um, capacity to, um, to to kind of use it in in real life at the moment I think it's under discussion. Yeah. Carly in your capacity do you have any any insight on this for us? Sure. So I could tell you a little bit about um, how we're using it for public health work. Um, it's, it's not altogether actionable in terms of what we find, but when we observe increases in the virus amounts in wastewater settings, depending on that community that we're testing, we're able to really um, to help those different areas. For example, in um, Let's look back to November where we saw an increase around the holiday, the winter holiday times. 
So we were able to work with hospital communities and talk to them about the increase in the virus in the environment and what that might mean for their bed usage or for respirator usage and even trying to determine how many cases there might be coming based on census tract data that's provided. So there's ways to input clinical findings as well as census tract data to really try to make actionable items. What we're able to do with some of the smaller catchments, if we look at schools or university residence halls, what we can do is see an increase and then follow that up with a recommendation for using more masks, right? If, if they wanted to double mask in a specific residence hall or um, maybe move divert students from a specific dining hall if you're seeing a high increase in numbers that way. Really in, increase the, the usage of those non-pharmacological interventions like masking and physical distancing because we see an increase in the virus. Um, what's very interesting right now is that we're working on looking at sequencing of wastewater samples. Many other places are doing this as well. We're able to track lineages and compare those to clinical cases within the state of Delaware. We're also looking for variants of concern and many other states are doing that as well. And I think just looking at what's in the community can be very helpful to help us understand the big picture. And of course, we're talking about months and months of data analysis and really being able to compare what happened in this whole pandemic around the world. And so I think it's a, an excellent level of analysis. It needs to be used complementary, though, with clinical testing. It's not a standalone. All right. Thanks, Kelly. Um, Danielle, I have a question for you. Um, in, your, in your business, what, what were the biggest challenges that you faced and how did you overcome those? Yeah, it, probably the main challenges was about uh, really the supply chain. OK, we were as well facing this type of um, situation. I was mentioning to you, I think a couple of weeks ago that visiting customer, OK, and it was for other purposes. Finally, the first question was, are you able to provide PCR tips? to us, you know, because they've got huge issue even to find this small piece of plastic. So this is the type of, of things we have seen. And um, so working for Thermo Fisher, it's clear as well that um, it was at the very beginning of the pandemic, it was decided to really support the, the public health. And for instance, we realized very quickly that there will be a lack of some material. So like uh, the viral transport tube. OK, mm -hmm. and uh, just to, to show an example, finally, a production unit was built in less than two months in Kansas, Kansas City, OK, to to be able to provide enough VTM in the US. But that's the case as well in Perth, in Scotland. OK, we've got another uh, expansion there just to make sure we will be able to provide enough material to to support uh, all the testing that should be done regarding the pandemic. Yeah. Mm. I've, yeah. Thanks, Danielle. Um, ben, this is for Ben and Don. So I'll ask Ben first. Um, so when the pandemic significantly drops over the next year or so and everyone has been vaccinated, do you think the food industry will continue any of their revised COVID practices? And if so, which practices do you think will, will stay? Yeah, so maybe I'm not as optimistic as the question um, is. I, I think that the pandemic is something that we're going to deal with for, for quite some time. Um, I think certainly as vaccinations go up um, and and we, we move towards this concept of, of herd immunity, um, what we'll be battling with are, are clusters that pop up and, and that these will happen in our food manufacturing, food processing, restaurant, um, settings. And I, I think about the workforce that um, that we rely on so heavily in food and agriculture um, is is one of the it comes from so many communities that that we are going to have trouble getting vaccination um, uptake in. And I say that from our experiences here in the U.S. and in North America, I think that's something that that we'll see see worldwide. I, you know, going back to the previous question about waste wastewater screening. I really see the utility of, of that coming up 
in you know really importantly over the next couple of years to be able to identify by early, early analysis, analysis um, of, of these, of these uh, uh, potential, potential for, for clusters out there. So, so, so for so me, I, I, I think I we're going to be continuing, continuing to deal with this for, for quite some time, time and, and it's really going to be um, um, in our, our food producers world to, to maintain control over physical distancing. Um, so, you know, reimagining how we how we operate in, in the food world, because these, I, you know, I may, like I said, maybe I'm pessimistic, but I think we'll be dealing with these clusters for for years to come. It may not be a, a, a pandemic um, uh, of the amount that we're looking at, but certainly it's not it's not going to le uh, you know, magically leave our our food world at the end of 2021. Don, have you got anything you would like to add to that? Yeah, I'm, I'm not. I'm not sure how much more I have to add. I think that the the food industry will continue to. I, I, what I hope the industry does is they look. They look at what's going on and they respond accordingly, right? Like, uh, I mean, I think there's a bunch of things that we just don't even know if they work, right? Like, like plexiglass, right? I mean, I would. I for one would be happy to see plexiglass go away because I don't think it really helps. On the other hand, retaining masking policies, uh, stores having hand sanitizer available, that's that's probably a best practice, even not in the pandemic, right? And and having, you know, uh, procedures for sanitizing touch common touch points is good. Uh, but I, I really don't know. And it's very, you know, as, as uh, Yogi Berra once said, or maybe it was Niels Bohr, prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. Um, so I really don't know what's going to happen. And I'm, I'm very, I'm very interested to see what happens. But I think when we don't know, often it's sensible to take a conservative approach. So what I hope the industry does is I hope, I hope that if they do change what they're doing they do it slowly and deliberately rather than you know like some governors here have said oh no it's all fine we're done you know go ahead free for all i think that's the recipe for disaster and i hope i hope my colleagues in the food industry don't do that mm. i tend to agree with you the um the considered approach is probably the wise approach danielle did you want to did you want to comment because you had your hand up I would just, it was just about water surveillance as well. I'm pretty sure that finally, just the beginning of the story and that network will be developed. You know, for instance, in, in Europe, the European Commission is really supporting that. So it's more coming from right now the life science framework and i'm pretty sure this will move to routine testing analysis with all the quality assurance and we will put that in place you know because we are all thinking and we are all hearing that we might get other pandemics so mm -hmm. in fact we are learning as well and we should take the lessons so and water surveillance is certainly a cheap and reliable way to see what is going on emergence re-emergence you know uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure I see that Khalil agree. Yeah, I'm pretty sure yeah, that yeah, it will be in that direction. So as we're, as we're talking about water surveillance, um, one of the questions was about um, Kali's sewer project and how that actually links um, with the public health, with public health and epidemiology. Would you like to explain a little bit more about that, Kali? Sure. Uh, well, I, I really appreciate what, what Danielle just said, and I think across the world, it's being used as this positive tool, along with clinical testing, to really understand what's going on in the population. Um, I think the headlines that talk about the variants of concern are, are somewhat misleading, and I think really digging into that data now in terms of what's going on in the community, I think can be um, really useful to help us understand how this virus is mutating as it moves through populations. Um, and I think that we need to understand that from a public health perspective as we continue to think about vaccination and as the amazing scientists who have developed these vaccines are reconsidering how they can redevelop these vaccines and what changes they might make um, as we see these different modifications or different mutations come up. I mean, just in some of the samples we've seen, we I have identified mutations that aren't necessarily variants of concern, but we don't know what that means. And if they're not mutations in the spike protein, 
what do they mean to the virus? And so we're able to then communicate that with other scientists in the public health community to try to understand what that might mean globally. And so I, I, I think it's an incredible tool for us to use um, along with you know everything else that we've got in our toolbox in order to try to control um, the spread of the disease and also to watch for reemergence as we all you know begin to get some control around the world. Thanks, Carly. This is uh, one for Ben and Don. Um, FUCOVINET looks like a really useful, interesting tool. How can we access this information? Is it public and online? Ben. Yeah, so um, uh, it, it is, uh, and, and we're right in the midst of, uh, of starting our data generation right now, but you can go to foodcovi.net um, and follow us on Twitter um, at foodcovinet uh, and on Instagram. Um, so the, the information's out there, but also in the, like, what I didn't mention in my talk earlier, um, we, we are um, in the midst of um, launching some sort of a newsletter to stay up to date on uh, what is coming out in in the literature on a you know weekly monthly basis um, so there's there's a a process for that and that will also be a, a way as we um, start generating data that we'll be um, launching it also we um, will be presenting um, hopefully some preliminary data at IAFP in uh, 2021 uh, in Phoenix so um, yeah so follow us follow us there Fantastic. Don, would you like to say something? Yeah, I'll just add that one really important thing that, that we are learning to emulate uh, amongst our European colleagues is when you get a grant, it has to have a really cool name. And we deliberated long and hard to come up with foodcovi.net. And one of the most critical things that we did was to go out and get the donate the domain foodcovi.net early. Um, I think we even did that before we were funded, uh, just just on, on on spec. And so uh, yeah, so it's and I think you know branding is really important. I think Ben and his team have done a wonderful job um, coming up with some branding and stuff. And so yeah, but it's but it's it's so so it's it's about substance, but it's also about style. Well said. Well said though. All right. Question for Danielle. Danielle, a uh, question came in regarding um, the test methods that you described and how quickly uh, were those, uh, were those test, test methods, methods approved? Oh, yeah, OK. So good question. So in fact, the, the kit we are using were already available for clinical testing. OK, and you know that early April last year, finally, there were already several PCR kits available to, to run uh, the clinical analysis. So it was decided on our side. So in August, OK, 2020 as well to let's say, to transfer this kit for environmental test, uh, monitoring, okay? And uh, of course, the R&D, everything was run really quickly. So let's say a little bit before August, so July, August, September, full R&D and validation work, okay? Uh, and we had uh, finally the, the claim from AOEC early, early January. Yeah, but as I mentioned during my talk, uh, I think what the initiative from AOEC is really, really, we can be only impressed with that because it's not so easy to run third party validation study to build as well a community around that, you know, uh, being able to to build up uh, everything, the method and all this type of things. Yeah, for sure. They are unique in that uh, in that sense, for sure. You do not see that with the other one. OK, panel, panel, this is my final question for the day, so I'm going to ask it and then I'll ask each of you in turn to give me your, your view on it. So what actions would you expect um, an SME to take to ma minimise the risk of transmission um, in, in a plant? So I'm going to go to Ben because you're at the top, top right hand corner of my screen. Ben, would you go first, please? So just following up on some of the stuff I mentioned earlier, I, I think the real focus on how do you limit shared air in space, um, really thinking about um, what what a facility looks like, how can I, what, what, what is within my control to um, move people around and to really think about the biggest risk of aerosolization of the virus and managing that that air and space and it's this is like a fantastic question 
it's such a hard like answer to give something that's really specific other than thinking about what we do in all things you know risk management wise in the world of food of let me sit back let me figure out what what my number one risks are or what my number one hazards are and what the risk is and then how do i address that here and i you know for me at the top is reevaluating space air process okay thank you ben rebecca yeah thank you helen so as you'd expect we we've published um, a lot of guidance for businesses in different circumstances and you can find that on the FSA website. Um, so I'd say a couple of things. Firstly, um, what, one of the things that um, I think will be obvious to everyone who works in food production in the industry is that a lot of the things that you need to do to manage COVID are just basic um, good practice because the food industry has such a focus on good hygiene anyway. So, so things like, um, you know, being really um, clear that, that people you, you can't turn up to work when you're sick and work in a food production environment that these, these are policies that already exist excellent hand hygiene for example um you know really clear um sort of separation of different um uh, things that could potentially be contaminants on a production line you know really fantastic you know all of these things so so i think that they were um food food is very safe certainly in um countries that have uh, strong regulation and uh, and and, um, uh, you know, well-established uh, uh, good food hygiene practices. So, um, so that's a good starting point. The, the things that the things that have been a bit different, um, as uh, as I think Ben was talking about. So, thinking about the whole environment. So, not not just the production line, but um, the communal areas that there might be. Um, you know, places where workers may may be together formally or informally. Um, so, uh, work canteens, for example, things like that. Um, I know some companies have uh, introduced systems where they're limiting contact between different groups of workers. So, um, you know, sort of having uh, uh, sort of um, uh, not, not only different shifts, but, but being really clear that different groups of workers are working differently so that if if somebody has to um, self isolate in a group of workers that there's less disruption then and, um, and 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 there are some broader issues i think that have come to the fore as well for the food industry so um uh, again in the uk we've had discussions about um, the support that people need in order to self isolate so if you're going to be asked not to come into work um, you know, making sure that the that the um, the support is there so that people feel able to do that and that they don't hide symptoms or they don't um, uh, you know do their best to avoid that. So, and that's a broader issue. That's not just the food industry. That that brings in government support as well, sick pay, you, you know, support for self isolating, everything like that. So, so it's quite complex. But but I think um, you know the food industry can can take pride in the way that they they work anyway. And, and that's a really good platform for being COVID safe. Thank you, Rebecca. Danielle. Yeah, I, I, I agree with um, or I echo what Rebecca said. I think the, the food industry is really well organized and all the HCCP, everything is already there. And finally, they are used to develop this type of rationale. Of course, in that case, it's not uh, managing a foodborne um, virus. Okay, it's a little bit different. So it's about protecting workers, co-workers regarding the virus. So, and I'm sure they all have a look to the um, governing bodies to look at the guidelines because the authorities made a wonderful work okay uh, if you look at uh, all the let's say national authorities in europe but if you look as well in the us for the cdc fda okay everybody was really trying to, to do the best to support the industry maybe in some cases um, there are still some questions so regarding sme sometimes they don't have as well all the human resources like uh, expert with viruses and so on and I'm sure now it's easy as well to to be in in touch you know with people being able to support okay the rationale they, they will be developing on site yeah. mm -hmm. but I'm, I agree with Rebecca I'm fully confident in what they are doing for sure <laughs> thank you Daniel uh, Kali any further comments on this subject 
Yeah, I echo what everyone has said. I really think that the point about contact tracing remains important. We don't want to forget about who's been in contact with who as we move forward and definitely ventilation. You know, in all buildings, I think we are rethinking ventilation. School classrooms in particular, we see a lot of that in the U.S. now discussing as children are going back to school, sometimes for the first time in food production facilities. It's harder to think about ventilation. You can't open a window <laughs> and just increase the airflow. Um, so that's really goes back to thinking about the whole HVAC system and, and that can be very difficult, and, and but it deserves consideration. Hmm. Well, finally, some words from Don. Yeah, the, the, I, I guess I get to have the last word, but unfortunately, most of the words have already been said. But let me let me add a couple of uh, salient points that I think tie everything together. I think as we move forward, we need to, just as we have already done, continue to make have our decisions be based on the best available science. And then also they need to be risk based, right? And so we only have a limited amount of funding. We need to focus on what are the interventions that have the greatest reduction on risk. And to do that, I think we have a couple of general tools, right? We have, and I'll put both of these tools in the bucket of modeling, because that's one of my, one of, one of the things that I'm known for. And I would say, you know, looking at case control studies, looking at factors that control risk is really important important. Um, Food Kobe Net is doing some, some work being led by Ben that we're not prepared to talk about yet, but, but that will hopefully provide science-based guidance on what the factors are that really do reduce risk. And then also sort of still in the area of modeling and statistics in terms of ventilation, being able to collaborate with folks that do computational fluid dynamic modeling, CFD modeling, to look at airflows within buildings, right? There's a lot of models that say, okay, we just need to double the airflow. Okay, well, yeah, so you double the airflow, but what are the energy costs from that? And if you double the airflow, does that really double the airflow in the whole building? Are there dead spaces? Thinking about building design, all of that's really important. And so I think modeling and statistics can help us with both aspects of that so that we're really making the very best science-based and risk-based decisions. Thank you, Don. Well, it just leaves me to say thank you to the panel. Uh, for, for a great discussion this afternoon. I would also like to thank the team at Zero to Five and Orchard for enabling us to have this great conference today and put all of this information out there for everybody to, to listen to. Um, I would like to thank everybody who signed up and registered and attended today's session uh, for your attention. And I'd ask you all to please give us some feedback. There's a link in the chat. So please could you feed back to us? We'd be really interested in your thoughts and what, what you found of today's session and also as well some perhaps some thoughts for future events. If you've enjoyed today, as you know, I'm working on the European Symposia as we speak. So on the 27th and the 28th of April, we will have the European Symposium. So if you've enjoyed this, come and, come and join us then and you'll get some more of the same. So um, look forward to seeing you in April in, the, in our virtual conference. And of course, we look forward to our next UKFP conference, which will be scheduled for 2022. So thank you all and uh, I wish you all a ha health and happiness and keep safe and look after each other and hope to see you soon. Hopefully see you, uh, see you guys in Phoenix, if I don't see you in European. Okay, all the best. Thank Thanks, you very Alan. much. Okay, bye.